to study to show ourselves approved unto God, workmen that he is not to be ashamed, rightly dividing the word of truth. All right, 2 Corinthians in chapter number 5. 2 Corinthians in chapter 5. And uh, man, I want to tell you what. Between Friday afternoon and most of the day yesterday, uh, I, I felt like I was almost drugged out of my mind. I didn't do much but try and recover from all week of VBS and then all week of trying to keep up with 14, 15, 16-year-olds at camp. Uh, I think every counselor that went said the exact same thing. Uh, I, man, I'm going to tell you what, you really find out, you really find out that 25 years or so makes a big difference uh, from being, you know, 15, 16, 17 years old. I didn't think, used to think it did, but after running around with them and doing all the activities with them and such as that and trying to keep up, man, they just don't quit. They just keep on going. Praise God. Ask Brother Charlie and Brother John. They stayed in the room with them boys. Thankfully, I had a little room off the side where I get where it was quiet. But uh, I think they had to threaten some of them boys with an inch of their life. Y'all need to go to sleep or we're going to kill one of you. Praise God. And, uh, huh? It wasn't that bad in your room. <laughs> Over there at the Holiday Inn where y'all was staying at. Praise God. We're going to come to y'all's place over there. We're going to bring all them boys to y'all's room next year about 1 o'clock in the morning. All the cooks, I know they wore out and tired too. Brother Keith and Miss Deb, Brother Kent and Miss Neat, Brother Skip and Miss Sheila, they up every morning before the sun ever got up cooking and getting ready and trying to feed that army of kids that we had. So God sure did meet with us. Had folk got saved, hearts got touched, lives got changed, decisions that were made. Uh, that will change people's eternities. And I thank the Lord for it. Thank you, church, for praying. Give you that challenge before we left. Brethren, pray for us. And I appreciate y'all taking it to heart and praying and asking God to help us. All right, 2 Corinthians chapter 5 this morning. Uh, we've been looking at things that we know out of chapter 5. That, that's the way Paul starts the chapter out. He started chapter, out, chapter 5 out by saying, For we know. So we've looked at a lot of different things that we know. We know about our tabernacle, this, this tabernacle we're dwelling in, but the tabernacle that we're going to put on one day. We not only know about our tabernacle, we know about our transport. We're going to get out of this body, be absent from the body, be present with the Lord one day. We know about the trial that we're going to. We're going to stand before the trial, the judgment seat of Christ as Christians uh, to receive the things done in our body, good or bad. Then last week we started looking at, we know the terror. We know our terror. And we find that in verse number 11. Let's pick up there where we left off last week. Dealing with this judgment seat of Christ thought. Dealing with standing before Jesus Christ. And those eyes like fire gazing down into our soul. And we're having to answer for what we've done since we've been saved. Good or bad. This is what Paul says about that event in verse 11. Knowing therefore... In light of this judgment seat we're going to stand before, knowing therefore the terror of the Lord. Uh, uh, brother, everything about the Lord's not just love and grace and mercy and peace, even though I thank God for that. Man, it said there's going to be some terror coming from him as well. And because we know the terror of the Lord, we persuade men. Talk about save men. That's what I'm doing this morning, what I did last week. I'm trying to persuade you to get ready as a Christian for the judgment seat of Christ. Don't just live your life, you know, happy-go-lucky, blase, what shall be, shall be, and no big deal, I'm going to do what I want to do. You better be living with eternity in view. All right, we talked about that last week. Let's move on to the last part of the verse. He said this, but we are made manifest unto God. And I trust also are made manifest in your uh, consciences. Paul said we are made manifest unto God. In other words, dealing with this judgment seat of Christ that's coming, dealing with us standing before the eyes of our Savior and Him inspecting our work that we've done for Him, we are trying to live a life that makes manifest or makes, uh, makes foolproof of what we're doing to the Lord. We, we're made manifest unto, the God, unto God. In other words, the Lord knows exactly what we've been doing. You may be able to hide it from the preacher or hide it from your husband or hide it from your wife or hide it from the church members, but the Lord knows exactly who's been really seriously serving him and who hasn't. Uh, he knows. We're not fooling the Lord this morning. God knows the real us. 
God knows what we really do for him and why we do it for him. God knows our motives. God knows our methods this morning. And then he says in the last part of the verse, and I trust also are made, we are made, manifest in your consciences. Paul said, and y'all know what we've done for the Lord too. He said, the Lord doesn't just know, y'all know as well. That's the Bible pattern. The Bible pattern is this. Live your life for the glory of God to where God knows that you've been a faithful servant. And then if you live your life as a faithful servant for Jesus Christ, people will start knowing that you are as well. He said, we're made manifest to God, but also to your consciences. Uh, it is our job to be our brother's keeper. A lot of times we get this idea, well, I'm going to do what I want to do, and I don't care what nobody thinks. Well, when it comes to living for truth and doing what's right, maybe that's got some validity to it. But no man lives to himself, no man dies to himself. It is your job to present an honest Christian life so that others are not offended in their conscience by, by a, a, a lackadaisical Christian walk. So he said, we're made manifest unto God. I trust also are made manifest in your consciences. Now watch verse number 12. It's a great verse, especially the latter part of it. He said, for we commend not ourselves again unto you, but give you occasion to glory on our behalf that you may have somewhat to answer them, which glory in appearance and not in heart. In other words, he's saying in verse number 12 where he said, we commend not ourselves again unto you, but we're giving you occasion to glory on our behalf. He's saying the only reason why we're telling you about all of our ministry experiences, people that were saved or burdens we've borne or things we've gone through is because there were people that were coming along at the church of Corinth and other churches Paul had started. They're coming through and they lied on the apostle Paul. They said, well, he's not really an apostle. He's not really preaching the gospel. He's not this, he's not that. And Paul said, the only reason why I'm saying some of the things I'm saying about the ministry uh, is not so I get glory, but it's so you can tell those people, no, we know about Paul's testimony. We know what he's been doing for God. We know he's a true apostle. We've seen the signs and wonders. We are his sign and seal of apostleship in the Lord. So that's why Paul does it. But watch the last part of the verse. This is, this is a really uh, great, great thought here. He said that you may have someone to answer them Look at these people right here. Which glory in appearance and not in heart. Uh, Paul said there are certain people that the only reason why they do what they do is to be seen. They glory in appearance, not in heart. They're not interested in keeping their heart right. They're just interested in getting the glory. Uh, you realize there's Christians and there are people that are saved that the reason they do a lot of the things they do, it's not so God gets the glory. It's so they get the glory. It's not so somebody else gets help. It's so they get a pat on the back for it. And they glory in appearance. Man, I, 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 I know a lot of ministries and preachers that are like this. They glory in appearance. In other words, how big a building do you got? That's the validity, you know, of your ministry. You got a big building. Appearance. How many people do you run? How many you got in Sunday school? How many did you baptize? How, how, how many church buses you got? How many this, how many that? You know what that is? That's glorying in appearance. Uh, brother, the, the validity of a person's ministry is not necessarily counted on how many people are sitting in the pews or how big a buildings they got. Some of the greatest preachers that are faithful to the Lord and gonna get crowns and rewards in heaven, some of the greatest preachers I've ever known, they pastor little old bitty churches up in the hollers of West Virginia and Kentucky and, and if I called their name this morning, you wouldn't know them. And I've drove up there into them little churches, and they love those people, and they preach to those people, and they have 30, 40, 50 people show up, but they're planted where God wants them at, and they're doing a work for God, and they're never going to have a mega church. They're never going to have thousands. They're never going to have hundreds. They're ministering to 30 and 40 and 50 people, but they're faithful where God planted them. And to certain people, they would look at that and say, well, they, they, who cares about that? That ain't no big deal. Well, God cares about it. Because our, we're not told to glory in appearance, but in heart this morning. Um, that's, that's a, turn to Galatians chapter 6. Look what Paul says to the Galatians dealing with that. <clears throat> Galatians in chapter number 6. And look at verse number 12. We're going to run some references on this real fast. <laughs> Galatians 6, 12. In other words, what Paul's saying is we don't do what we do to look good. We do what we do to please God out of a heart of love for him. 
I'm, I'm curious this morning. Why do you do what you do? Like you're here this morning. I'm glad you're here this morning. I would, I would, I've told you this before and I'll tell you again. I would much rather preach to people than pews. I preach to both. I'd rather preach to people. Normally people give you a better response than pews. Normally. There are some people I've preached to that I believe pews give you as good a response as people do. But, but I, I, I'd rather preach to people than pews. I'm called to minister to people. That's my job, to minister to people. That's what God's asked me to do. So that's what I want to do. I love, I love what God's asked me to do. But this morning, why are you here? I mean, did you only come so that you could be seen when you pass out your track, when you, when you do what you do for the glory of God in your personal life, in your personal walk? Are you doing those things simply out of a heart of, Lord, I love you? Or do you do these things out of a heart of motivation? Well, I, I want to make sure people know what I'm doing. I want to make sure people see that. I want people, man, that's, you don't get no reward for stuff like that. The only things you get rewards for is stuff that's done for the glory of God and the honor of Jesus Christ and just for him, not for anybody else. Look what Paul said about some people here uh, in verse number 12 of Galatians 6. Uh, Galatians 6, 12, he said, As many as desire to make a fair show in the flesh. That's what some Christians' whole life's about. It's, it's about making a show. It's just a fair show in the flesh. They constrain you to be circumcised only lest they should suffer persecution for the cross of Christ. In other words, he said, if they really started suffering persecution, they probably wouldn't keep living for God. Their show is only good while everything's going good. Man, the mark of a real Christian, <laughs> uh, whether you're doing it for show or doing it for the Lord, is when you start suffering persecution and things start going wrong in your life and you keep living for the Lord. Because if you do what you do just to be seen when troubles come and burdens come and nobody's saying thank you and nobody's saying good job, at a girl, at a boy, and all of a sudden it just comes down to, well, Lord, I didn't do it to get an at a boy or at a girl anyways. I did it so that one day I could hear, well done, thou good and faithful servant, I'm doing it for you. See, that kind of Christian life, it'll serve God even through persecution. Even when things go wrong. Because, you know, look what the Bible said about the Pharisees. Go with me to Matthew chapter 6. Watch what the Bible said about the Pharisees. Man, really, I, I'll be honest. I, I have to check myself. Uh, I think every Christian has to do this from time to time. You have to check yourself. And I, and I have to ask myself this from time to time. Zorn, why are you doing what you're doing? Zorn, what's your motive behind the sermons you preach? What's the motive behind the service that you do? What's the motive behind the prayers you pray? What's the motive behind the standards that you have in your life of doing this or not doing that or living for the Lord? And, and, and what, what is your motivation? Is it just so you can be seen or is, are you doing it because you love me? Because if you're doing it to be seen, it's no better than the Pharisees. And watch what the Bible says. Jesus says this little thought three times in Matthew 6 about having a reward. Look at Matthew 6 and verse number um, 2. Matthew 6, 2. Therefore, when thou doest thine alms, in other words, when you're given, do not sound a trumpet before thee, as the hypocrites do in the synagogues and in the streets, that they may have glory of men. Verily, I say unto you, they have their reward. You say, what reward do they got? Their reward is a temporal, superficial, carnal reward, and they get it right here, right now. I am not looking to get my rewards here. I'm looking to get my rewards yonder. Now, if you want to, you can have your rewards here. Live your Christian life just in appearance sake, and you can get your rewards here. Men will glory over you. People will promote you. People say this, that, about And you can get your rewards here. I'm not looking to get my reward here. Jesus says this thought three times. Look at verse 5. He, he, he says it again at the end of verse 5. Watch the whole verse. Verse 5, and when thou prayest. So we've talked about giving. Now we're talking about praying. When thou prayest, thou shalt not be as the hypocrites are. For they love to pray standing in the synagogues and in the corners of the streets. So they may be seen of men barely. I say unto you, they have their reward. They're getting it right now. Verse 16. Verse 16. Now we're talking about fasting. Moreover, when ye fast, be not as the hypocrites of a sad countenance, for they disfigure their faces that they may appear unto men to fast. Verily I say unto you, they have their reward. 
Man, three times the Lord said that. They have their reward. They have their reward. They have their reward. What are they getting? They're getting their reward right here. I mean, literally. How, 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 for lack of better words, and not saying this tongue in cheek, how pharisaical is this? These are the Pharisees. How pharisaical is this? That they would literally blow a trumpet in front of them when they walked into the house of God to put their money in the collection box. Y'all see me? Here I go. Here I go. <laughs> you you got that short award. You got it right there. People saw you, and somebody said, "Man, look at that! He put a bunch of money in there. That he got his reward." God didn't do. God looked at it and said, "You a joke." It, it added up to zero. When he's praying, when he's praying, he don't got no personal, private prayer life. Man, I, I, <laughs> I'm, uh, I've always thought to myself: some people you can tell if they've got a personal, private prayer life or not. Listen to them either pray over their food or, or such as that. Uh, you, uh, you know how I can tell that a lot of our men got a personal prayer life? Because when they pray over the offering, it's not a 25-minute prayer. You know how you can tell when somebody don't got a personal prayer life? When they get in front of people and start praying, like over the food or over the offering, they just start praying for everything and just go on and on and on and on and on and on and on. Bro, we just asked you to pray over the food. We didn't ask you to pray for the missionaries and the church and the offering for this and for that. Just pray. Say, Lord, thank you for this food. We appreciate it. Pray you bless the hands that prepared it in Jesus' name. Amen. But 10 minutes later when the food's getting cold and they're still praying, hey, bro, catch up on your prayer life in your prayer closet. All we ask you to do is pray over the offering. <laughs> Lord, thank you for this offering. We appreciate it. Help the service. Help the preacher. Bless the singing. Lord, help us. In Jesus' name, you know, man, praise God. They, so, I, they, I, I've been in some church services before that the pastor called on somebody to pray to dismiss the service. We, they have church all over again. <laughs> 20, I'm standing in the back waiting to shake hands, and I'm like, praise God. So what done happen in there? Brother's still praying. Man, it, it, get your prayer life done back at the house. Amen. You understand what I'm saying? Here it said they fast. Here they start fasting. And instead of just putting their normal clothes on and acting like everything's good, they put the raggediest old clothes they could on, kind of sucked their cheeks in, and held their stomach and walked around. Said they disfigured their faces. They walked around, oh, I'm so hungry. What you hungry for? I'm fasting. I'm fasting. That's like, I, was, I think I said something about this here a little while back, one of our men fasting for a camp. I had no idea he was fasting. He was at VBS, he was working, he was playing, he was laughing. When I tried to get him to eat a hamburger is when I only found that out. But you never know it. That's fasting. Don't let nobody know what you're doing. You say, why? Because you, you get rewards from him, not them. So here in, back in our text, Paul said these people, they're, they're, they glory in appearance and not in heart. Glory in appearance and not in heart. Uh, I believe one of the most damaging things that we've got today, and, and we try and use it for the glory of God. We try and use it because it's available to us. I believe if Paul was alive today, he'd probably try and use it for the advancement of the gospel. One of the most damaging things we have today is social media. Honestly, I wish, so, I wish we could do away with social media. I wish, I wish we could just do away with Facebook, Instagram, Snapchat, Twitter, and all that. You say, why? What's it about? Most of it's about self-promotion. It's all about self. And it's a, it's a thing where people glory in appearance. I have literally, this is a God's honest truth, I know ministries, y'all take my word for this. You may not know this, but take my word for this. I know ministries right now, Brother Rodney. I mean, preaching ministries such right now that if social media, YouTube and social media ceased to exist, they would have no ministry. Nobody would show up to hear them preach. They wouldn't have nowhere to go preach. People would stop calling them. The only way they got places to preach or an audience to preach to is they got it on the internet. I thank God when my ministry, when God put me in the ministry and got it started, there wasn't no such thing as social media. I'd come along years after that. Thank God, because I'd have been tempted to be right there in the same boat with them. Most of the time on the social media I got, I don't even tell people where I'm going or when I'm going or such as that. The only reason I keep the website updated that I had when I was in evangelism is so some of y'all can figure out where I'm going to be at and, and tune in during the week to listen to, as our church people. That's it. I, I just, man, it, it's just not that big a deal to me. I know what God's called me to do. I know what God's asked me to do. 
and I'm not worried about the appearance of what people think about it. Man, if I was worried about appearance and such as that, I, I'd have changed a lot of stuff or quit a long time ago because I take heat weekly for what I preach and what I believe on social media and on the internet and people texting me and emails and such as that. I'm just not that worried about it. Some of y'all need to get up in the morning and drink about a five-gallon bucket. I don't give a real. <laughs> Make your mind up. You're going to live by the Bible. Live by the Scripture and, and stop worrying about trying to please everyone. Start pleasing God out of a pure heart. Anyways, watch what he says now in verse 13. We're still talking about basically this terror of the Lord, making sure that, that you're right with God on your way to the judgment seat. Uh, making sure that your heart's right, not just appearance. Making yourself manifest to God. And then watch verse 13. I like what old Paul said here, verse 13. For whether we be beside ourselves, it is to God. Or whether we be sober, it is for your cause. I love that first part of verse 13. Whether we be beside ourselves, it's to God. That, the little phrase, beside ourselves, it's mentioned in the Bible several times. It literally means people think you're crazy. He's beside himself. In other words, he's like out of his, out of his mind. When they say you're out of your mind, that's, what, that's where it comes from. Beside yourself. In other words, you've stepped out of yourself. Beside yourself. You're crazy. You lost your mind. That crazy world, that's what they think about us. That crazy world thinks we're crazy. But brother... My craziness that they think I'm crazy about, it's to God. They think I'm crazy for the way I worship and for the way I witness and for the way I walk and for the way I talk. They think you're crazy for being in church this morning. They think you're crazy for the book you read. They think you're crazy for living a life and trying to live holy and not running with them to all the stuff. That, they think you're crazy. But don't forget this. They're the ones that say... You know, it's okay for a man to be a woman and a woman to be a man and then there ain't no genders and there's, you know, all these, you know, 30 different kinds of genders. They're the ones that say stuff like that. Don't tell me I'm crazy. They're the ones that would say we all came from a rock and a big bang and we morphed out from a puddle to paradise. Don't tell me I'm crazy. You got fairy tales for adults. Don't tell me I'm crazy. You think it's all right to murder babies in the womb and then try and save the whales and things like that. Don't tell me I'm crazy. You crazy. But they said, he said, whether we be beside ourselves, in other words, they think we're beside ourselves, it's to God. Don't, don't worry about it. Don't worry about them saying you're crazy. Just keep on being crazy for Jesus. The Bible said we are fools for Christ's sake. You know why some people won't live for God? Because they're scared of ridicule. They don't want to be called crazy. They don't want to be looked at different. Well, I got news for you. If you live for Jesus Christ according to the word of God, you're going to be different in this world. Amen. And if you're not different in this world, then I got an update for you too. You're not living like a Christian should live according to the Bible. You're called to not be conformed to this world. You're called to be a peculiar people, zealous of good works. You're called to be a spectacle unto the world and to angels and to men and be fools for Christ's sake. You are called in this world to basically the world look at you like you're beside yourself. That's the Christian life. Do you realize that is said about three different cla classes of people? Let me show it to you. It's, they said that about our Lord Jesus. They said it about our Lord. Take your Bibles and go with me to the book of Mark in chapter 3. Look what they said about your Savior. They said he was crazy too. I'd say we in real good company. Yeah, they said Jesus was crazy. Look at Mark chapter 3 and verse number 20. Mark chapter 3 and verse 20. Jesus is starting his earthly ministry. He has just ordained his 12 apostles. He is preaching. He's teaching. The people by the multitudes are coming to hear him. Mark 3, 20. And the multitude cometh together again so that they could not so much as eat bread. There's so many people gathered around they can't even eat. Verse 21. And when his friends heard of it, talking about Jesus, when his friends heard of it, they went out to lay hold on him, for they said, <laughs> he beside himself. He crazy. See, they said it about Jesus. They didn't just say it about Jesus. They said it about the apostle that you are to follow, the apostle Paul, our apostle, the apostle of the Gentiles. Go with me to the book of Acts in chapter 26. 
Look at Acts chapter 26. They said Jesus was crazy. Now look, they're going to say Paul's crazy for following Jesus. Acts 26. And verse 22. Paul's a preaching here to uh, King Agrippa. And in Acts 26, 22, he said, Having therefore obtained help of God, I continue unto this day, witnessing both to small and great, saying none of the things than those which the prophets and Moses did say should come, that Christ should suffer, and that he should be the first that should rise from the dead, and should show light unto the people and to the Gentiles. Verse 24, And as he thus spake for himself, Festus said with a loud voice, Paul, thou art beside thyself. You crazy, Paul. Preaching about a man that you say was God's son that died, buried, rose again, ascended back to heaven and coming again. You are beside yourself. Much learning doth make thee mad. But he said, I'm not mad, most noble Festus, but speak forth the words of truth and soberness. See, that world looks at us and they say, you are crazy for believing what that Bible says, but I'm not. I'm speaking the words of truth and soberness. I'm thinking clear. How many of y'all remember when you got saved and you had lived, some of y'all got saved not as a young person, but got saved, you know, after 21 years of age. You had already lived a good while and had run around that world for a while. Some of y'all got saved even later than that. Do y'all remember how it was like your thinking changed? How you used to look at things one way and all of a sudden your thinking just, it was like lights came on. You said, how come I never seen that before? <laughs> you started thinking clear. You used to be crazy. You ain't crazy no more. Every lost person without Jesus Christ, they crazy. They are. They're crazy. They got, the, the Bible talks about uh, that I have the Spirit of God inhabiting my body. The Spirit of God, the Holy Ghost. Them, them lost people, brother, they're just a straight up channel and medium for any time an unholy or an unclean spirit wants to pop in. And you know what the Bible said about unholy, unclean spirits? It said they're like birds. He said when the Word of God is sown, then come the fowls of the air and took it away. The Bible talks about over there, uh, uh, Babylon has fallen, has become the hold of every unclean, hateful spirit and bird. Birds are a picture of unclean spirits in the Bible. The dove is a picture of the Holy Spirit. Other birds, the owl and the, uh, the, the cuckoo and the, uh, the raven and the vulture and all that, it's a picture of demons and devils. And that's why people say things like this. They say, he's got bats in the belfry. Crazy. They call them bird brain. You're a bird brain. And then in Ecclesiastes over there it says, Curse not the king, nor not thy bedchamber, for that which hath wings shall tell the matter. A bird of the air shall tell the matter. And so now all the ladies say, Where'd you hear that piece of information? They say, A little bird told me so. They come out of the Bible. Brother, I'm not crazy. That world's crazy. If you lost this morning, you ain't sane. Because you don't know the truth. Jesus said, I am the way, the truth, and the life. Ye shall know the truth. And the truth shall make you free. One day I, I found the truth. And this world thinks I'm crazy. But I'm not. They crazy. And they'll figure it out one day. But it'll be a little bit too late when they figure it out. Anyways, back to our text here. Back to our text uh, in St. Corinthians. He said, whether we be beside ourselves, it's to God. People say, why are you acting like that? I'm doing it for the Lord. People watch how we cry and shout and carry on. Raise our hands. Run up and down the aisles. How we preach. And they think we're crazy. I'm not crazy. Isn't it funny? Isn't it hilarious? That here coming up football season. Uh, people can paint their face. Get absolutely sloppy drunk. I mean brother. till they just act like total fools. And just spout the vilest profanity. And stand up in football stadiums or NASCAR stadiums and scream and holler and flip out. And no big deal. That's normal. But I come to church and start preaching and singing and shouting and crying in my right mind about a risen Savior that really died for my sins, really got up, really come back to get me. And they say, man, you crazy. Me? 
No, brother. No. I, I'm all right. You're the one that's crazy. He said this in verse 13, whether we be beside ourselves, it's to God. Or whether we be sober, uh, it is for your cause. In other words, whether, we're act, whether the people think we're acting crazy, it's for God. Whether we're being just dead serious as we can be, uh, it's for the glory of God and it's for your cause. It's to help you. It's for the cause of Christ and the establishing of the church. So we've not only seen our tabernacle, our transport, our trial, our terror, but now we're going to look at another uh, T word here. Look at verse 14, 15, 16. This is our true love. Oh, there ain't never been a better true love story than the love of Jesus Christ. Look at our true love. Verse 14. I, I love this verse. For the love of Christ constraineth us, because we thus judge that if one died for all, then we're all dead. I like how Paul says the love of Christ constraineth us. The word constrain, it means to force. It means to coerce. It means to compel or to drive something or someone to do something. It literally comes from the thought, Brother Travis, of, uh, uh, when I look this word up, it's kind of like a word picture. It, it, it has a meaning of driving cattle through a cattle gate, like you're driving them, pushing them in the direction you want them to go. And the Bible says what makes us go, what makes us, what makes us witness, what makes us serve, what makes us do what we do, I'll tell you what it is, it's the love of Christ that's driving us, forcing us, coercing us, compelling us. You know why we should be doing what we do this morning? Not necessarily out of our love for him, but out of his love for us. If you ever really understand and get a glimpse and really grab a hold of how much Jesus Christ loved you, you'll start loving him like you should. The Christian life boils down to this. The reason why a lot of Christians don't, don't do what they should do, it boils down to this. It boils down to a love problem. They don't recognize his love for them and they in turn do not respond with love for him. It's a love problem. One of the most haunting verses in all of the Bible, Matthew chapter 24 and verse number 12, talking about the last days, talking about that time closing in on uh, the great tribulation. Matthew 24, 12 said this, and because iniquity shall abound. In other words, iniquity will be everywhere. It will abound. Because iniquity shall abound, the love of many shall wax cold. Matthew 24, 12. You want to write that down. Brother, he said, because in the last days, iniquity is going to be everywhere on every hand. You know what it's going to cause God's people to do? It's going to cause their love to get cold. I don't want my love to get cold. Amen. Jesus Christ's love for me was never cold. It was red hot. 33 and a half years he lived on this earth. He did those things that pleased the Father, and he loved sinners. The Bible said he was a friend of publicans and sinners. The Bible said, this man receiveth sinners and eateth in them. The Son of Man has come to seek and to save that which was lost. He come and died and bled for me. Love me. Prove that he loved me. Now he lives for me and loves me as well. And my job is to keep my love burning for him like his love burned for me. It's the love that constrains me, pushes me, coerces me to do what I do. The Bible said of that church uh, in, uh, uh, I, don't remember, I don't remember if it was Sardis or Pergamus, Thyatira, one of those churches in Revelation chapter 2, it said, I have, Jesus is talking, he said, I have somewhat against thee because thou hast left thy first love. You have walked away from the love that used to push you to do what you did. Remember when you first got saved, you were so madly in love with Jesus Christ? I mean, brother, you, you, you heard the songs for the first time, heard the preacher for the first time, read your Bible for the first time, and you just couldn't get enough of it. You was madly in love with him. It's the same thought and concept behind a husband and a wife. Same exact thought, same exact concept. Uh, you, you first started hooking up with that girl, hooking up with that guy. And y'all finally, you know, come to the marriage altar, swap vows, and you couldn't have been happier. I mean, you know, them first six months, your feet didn't hit the ground. You know, for somebody that's married for uh, three, four, and five years, my daddy said, oh, they ain't even got off their honeymoon yet. And that's about the truth. I say that now after being married for 17 years. That's the truth. 
I mean, you just, you know, everything is honky-dory and happy-go-lucky, and it's just wonderful. Then you start living with that person for a while, and they figure out you got issues, and you figure out they got issues. And you know what starts happening? If you don't keep and tend to the love of your home, your love will start waxing cold for that woman. Your love will start waxing cold for that man. If you don't remember originally what it was that drew you, you know what I found out? Ladies, the things that he used to do when y'all was dating that you just couldn't get enough of. You thought it was, oh, that's so cute. No, oh, that's so funny. and oh, all that's wonderful. Ten years into your marriage, that stuff ain't cute and funny and wonderful no more. It's like, if you don't shut up, I'm going to cut your head off. It used to be cute and funny and wonderful when he'd do whatever he does. That when you was dating, you thought it was just, oh, I love him for that. Now you hate him for it. If you don't constantly remind yourself and keep things in place, and I'm just giving you some marital counsel here for a minute. If you don't constantly keep things stoked right and keep things in place, your love for each other will start waxing cold. Husband, wife, it will. And it works the same. You, you know what you got to do? I've heard folks say this all my life. It's still the truth. Keep dating. Keep dating. Brother, take her out on a date every once in a while. Leave the kids at the house. Find a babysitter. Maybe you pass the kids' a stage. Now just take her out, just you and her. Go on out somewhere. Matter of fact, matter of fact, uh, I'm just I'm trying to survey my crowd here before I say something I shouldn't say here real quick, all right? <laughs> I make sure everybody's of, of correct age, all right? Make sure everybody's correct age. River, stop, stop years over her, son. Praise God. Here, here. You, you, want, you want to do something for her? Keep, keep the romance. Keep, keep the, I'm talking love. Keep, keep some of that, the feeling going every once in a while. Here's what you do. Surprise her. Put something nice on her and something nice on you. Go downtown Charlotte and go to a nice restaurant. Y'all just walk in and go eat. And then get on Priceline. You can rent a five-star hotel in downtown Charlotte for like 70 bucks for one night. I mean, nice ones. Get on Priceline. And just, she thinks you're going back home. Walk right on next door to the five-star hotel and it's just you and mama. And watch what one night won't do for your marriage. Oh, yeah, man. Now, some of y'all may be a little older or too old for some of that or think you are. Maybe you young people get a hold of that. That'll help you. You say, how do you know? I've been, I've been doing that for a long time. It's a blessing. You know what you got to do with Jesus Christ? He's the same yesterday, today, and forever. He don't change. His love for us is constant and consistent. Here's the problem. We don't keep our love for him stoked like we should. We stop reading his word. We stop enjoying fellowship with him. We get to the place where we come to his house and it's, well, it's just church again. Well, it's just a, no, it's time to enjoy with our Savior. I love him. He's been good to me. You got to constantly keep those things refreshed in your mind. The Bible said this, the love of Christ constraineth us. I love that. Then it said this, keep, keep reading. Because we thus judge, this is what we know. That if one died for all, then we're all dead. Can I tell you this this morning? Jesus did not just die for a select group of people. Jesus died for everybody. There's not one person, there's not one person that Jesus Christ did not die for. Everybody that you ever come in contact with, mark this down, I don't care if they're red, yellow, black, white, purple with pink polka dots on them, Jesus died for them. One died for all. The Bible said in Hebrews chapter 2 verse 9 that he by the grace of God should taste death for every man. There's nobody Jesus didn't die for. He did not die just for the elect. He died for all. You say, why? Because all were dead. Died for all of them. Thank you, buddy. God bless you. Amen. <laughs> Verse 15. Verse 15. And that he died for all. Now watch it. Everybody's not going to start living. Everybody's dead. But watch what it says. He died for all that they which live should not henceforth live unto themselves, but unto him which died for them and rose again. Everybody's dead and he died for all. But according to this verse, everybody ain't going to receive the free gift of eternal life to start living. It said he died for all, but they which live. 
It's not, I, I, w I wish everybody was going to get saved, but they ain't. I wish everybody had received the free gift of eternal life, but they won't. And it said he died for all, and this is what our job is, that they which live, those of us that have been resurrected to live with Christ, should not henceforth, from the time we've been given life, from the time we got saved, we should not henceforth live unto themselves, but unto him which died for them. Those of us who have experienced life in Jesus Christ are not supposed to live the life he gave us for ourselves anymore. We are to live our life for him. If you're saved this morning, Paul said this, I'm crucified with Christ, nevertheless I live. Yet not I, but Christ liveth in me. And the life which I now live in the flesh, I live by the faith of the Son of God who loved me and gave himself for me. He said, the life I'm living is not even my own anymore. I'm living for the one that died for me. Are you? It's your job. The only reason why Christians don't is because they just don't love him like they should. Henceforth, since you've been saved, you are not to live for yourself. It's not about us anymore. It's about Jesus. <laughs> Sorry, it's not. Jesus Christ's ministry was not about him. It was about others. Matthew 20 and verse 28, I believe it is. For the Son of Man came not be ministered unto, but to minister. And to give his life a ransom for many. You know what his job was? Others. Others. God and others. That's what Jesus Christ's whole life was about. God and others. You saved. He died for you. You got his life. Here's what your job is. God and others. God and others. Are you, are you living your Christian life for God and others? That's our job this morning. All right, let's do verse 16 and then we'll close and we'll start uh, a, a different, we'll, we'll deal with our transformation next week, but let's look at verse 16. Wherefore, henceforth, since we've been saved, know we no man after the flesh. Uh, yea, though we have known Christ after the flesh, yet now henceforth know we him no more. You say, what in the world does that mean? Well, he's saying in verse 16, henceforth, know we no man after the flesh. In other words, our job now as Christians, our, the basis of our Christian fellowship should be centered around our present spiritual condition. We don't know any man after the flesh. In other words, that's not what our job anymore is. Our, our whole basis of Christian fellowship is not what we're doing in the flesh or what this or that. What, what is our basis for Christian fellowship? Jesus Christ. We, we come, and we don't stand up here bragging about this, that, or the other. We come up lifting up the Word of God, something spiritual, Jesus Christ, something spiritual. That's our job. And then it said this about Jesus. Yea, though we have known Christ after the flesh, yet now henceforth know we him no more. In other words, Paul is saying, yeah, they, they touched him, they handled him, we, they knew him after the flesh, but he's seen at the right hand of the Father now. Now we have spiritual fellowship with him. The real basis of our Christian fellowship should be centered around spiritual things. Now, we may talk about our jobs. We may talk about a football game. We may, be talking about, we may talk about a trip to the lake, a trip to the beach, a trip to the mountains. There ain't nothing wrong with that. But the real center and basis for what we do here should be centered around the truth of the Word of God Amen. and getting the gospel out. That's, that's where the, that, that should be the epicenter of what we do. Why? Because we're not called to live for ourselves but for the one that died for us this morning. All right, let's pray. Father, thank you so much for your word. Thank you for the Sunday school hour. God, I appreciate the fact that you died for me. I, I am such a worthless worm of a sinner. I, I, know, I know the thoughts that I've had in my mind and the deeds that I've done with my hands and the words I've said with my mouth. And God, why you didn't just go ahead and put me in hell a long time ago is just strictly because of your good grace and your good mercy. I am so glad this morning that the Bible said in Romans chapter 5 that where sin abounded, grace did much more abound. This morning, thank you for your grace that's been shed abroad in my heart by the Holy Ghost which you've given to me. God, I pray this morning you'd give us a yearning, a desire, an earnest, fervent desire as your people to live for you because you died for us and now live for us. Help us now, Father, to lay our life down for the brethren, lay our life down for the things of God, take up our cross daily and follow you into this dark world. Shine the light of Jesus. Lord, see people saved. Somebody told us about Jesus one day. Help us to turn around and do that for somebody else. And we'll thank you for it in Jesus' name. 
Amen. All right, you dismiss right there.